The ability to read is a gift that many of us take for granted. A child who cannot read may never reach their life's potential. Joining us today in collaboration with the American Leadership Forum to discuss the importance of mastering basic literacy is April Javist of the Sacramento Literacy Foundation and Michael Lynch of Improve Your Tomorrow. April, who are the kids and communities that are most impacted by lower levels of literacy? To be honest, um, all kids are impacted by low, li low literacy levels. Um, and it, it does cut through stratification, through demographics. Um, right now in Sacramento, 37% of our kids across the county are at grade level reading. And every district has kids who are really struggling hard. Okay. And uh, if you met and compare that to pre-pandemic, how has uh, literacy been impacted by the onset of the last two and a half, three years of kids doing distance learning uh, and other modalities to make up for in-person education? That's a that's kind of the question of the moment right now. What you know? What is the impact of COVID nineteen? And measurably speaking, according to the standardized testing, we see a six point seven percent loss. But what's not in that measurement, and, and that's a loss in reading levels, what's not in that measurement are the high level of kids who are truant right now, which is more than doubled since COVID-19, and, and probably those kids didn't take the test. So that's not in that, in, in that measure. I think the silver lining of COVID is it showed everybody that we're failing at teaching kids to read. And we were failing before the pandemic, and we're failing now, but there are some solutions and people are starting to really put their head on it because COVID showed us, showed parents a lot of where their kids were really at as they tried to help them at their desks or with the home tests, those kind of things. Really was a big reveal, I think, for everybody. Michael, your work focuses around young people that are a little bit older than the grade school kids that April is, is speaking about, by the time they interact with you and improve your tomorrow, what have been the consequences if they don't have basic literacy proficiency? Yeah, we're seeing the after effects. So if a young person is not getting the support they need in first and second and third grade, we're getting them in middle school where they're already severely deficient. So let's say for example, if a kid can't or is not able to read at grade level, he's in class, he's gonna be a little more d disconnected. If he already has obstacles going on at home, behavior may be a concern. Because that kid can't read, he's not connected in class, he gets in trouble, he, he gets suspended. A kid who is suspended is more likely to drop out of high school. A kid who drops out of high school is more likely to have all the negative sort of effects that we don't want in society. So if a kid can't read, we're seeing all of the effects in which happen afterwards. It, it's interesting what you're saying because I would have never made the automatic association between reading proficiency and some of the other behavioral issues that uh, schools are also focused on at this time. Uh, April, I, I'm curious, what is it like for a child to not be able to keep up with their peers in class and 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 feel like they're not able to master the material. Thought about that child a lot, right? As I've been on this journey to see what we can do to get and to support all kids to get to grade level reading. And I think that kid has an enormous amount of staying power. I mean, here they are in a, in a, in a classroom where they, they are not understanding 50% of the information. And they're struggling and they're embarrassed to talk about it. But yet they come to class every day and they go through this struggle. How many hours? Maybe five hours a day. That is, that just, I, I, I don't think I would have done that if, if, if that had happened to me. I was, you know, in that group of people, of one out of three brains will read no matter what, very fortunate. Um, and that's irregardless of intelligence. One out of kids, one out of three kids will need support. Um, and, a, and, a, and an exact curriculum, and one out of three kids will just need an exact curriculum. 
But if I were that kid, I don't know if I would have the staying power that they have. I have a lot of respect for these kids. And I hope that I hope that what happens is some of them begin to help us think about how to educate better. Give us a sense of the difference between someone who, a child who hasn't received the right resources and a child who has a learning disability. Because sometimes uh, the, the community just assumes that if a child is not reading proficiently at a certain age level, that it's a disability. How, how do professionals make that distinction? So dyslexia has been categorized as a disability. Some think it's just like a thyroid problem, you know, that you just, your, your numbers are different. And so it's on a continuum. I think de detecting those, um, those differences is, is on the agenda for sure right now. SCOER, Sacramento County Office of Education, is working now on developing an early detection uh, process for dyslexia across the state. Um, but it's just detecting what kids need earlier on. We don't really learn about what kids need or where they're at in reading until they've taken a test at the end of the third grade, the CSAP. So that often is the first time that even parents learn, oh, my kid is struggling, right? They're not proficient. Um, and that's that's where we get the testing data from. And Scott, that's interesting because that, that, that to me is the major challenge. You know, like at Improve Tomorrow, we support a lot of kids who identify the special education. So they have an individual education plan and they're, but they're, they're tracked in it later for whatever reason, like they're tracked in it later and they're not provided their support that they need when they're in first or second or third grade. But even if you are identified as special education, doesn't always mean you get the resources. And for me, what is always to me, like a shocker is like black males are over identified as special education. So, cause oftentimes what they correlated to is some sort of behavior challenge. So you, you get all these different factors along the way that will inhibit your ability to be able to read at grade level, which means that, you know, you may not be as phenomenal of a student as you can. You know, uh, let's drill down on that a, a, a little bit, Michael. Your program is widely acclaimed and acknowledged as being able to take uh, young people, particularly young men from traditionally dis disadvantaged backgrounds and move them onto a, a life path where it is that they've got possibilities in terms of education and then beyond that careers. When you hear their stories, what do you hear? Are there any commonalities that come up uh, in their stories that talk about what the root causes are of why they were challenged so much in the first place? Uh, yeah, there's typically three variables are almost almost always one poverty uh two like the state of the family unit so the like one parent is gone most of the time as the father and three like is violence violence in or around the community that creates trauma when you have those three underlying or overlying sort of challenges it is it's more difficult for the kid to show up prepared to be able to go to school so Poverty is correlated with not having like the food resources and housing. I mean, like during the pandemic, we had we had young people who were living in two bedroom apartments full of eight people. How can you possibly focus right through a computer for Zoom? You have eight people in a two bedroom home with four of them also on the same computer or, or, or nearby going to school. Wow, April. One thing that I'm curious about in Michael's explanation, he didn't mention. The, the schools, and I want to know what role the schools play in either delivering the support that kids need within our, our communities or, or what it is that they're lacking uh, in terms of their own support. Can, can you give us a, a little bit of insight on that? Yeah, I, I just really quickly, though, want to also follow up on what Michael said. We do have the data here in Sacramento that shows a strong statistical correlation between kids who are hungry and kids who are not reading. Grade. Tell us more about that. Um, it's We just did the data. We ran it on the free and reduced meal program data that we gathered and the CSAP data. And there's a strong correlation, statistically speaking, um, between kids who are hungry and kids who are not reading. There's a strong correlation to nearly every positive and negative life outcome for kids who are reading and not reading. It is the 
equity skill. So what are schools doing? Um, I think I think what what's happening right now in the schools, um, and it's if it's happening, it's happening at the district level, is that schools are considering the the failures that we're looking at because of COVID in reading, and they're realizing just how important reading is. Uh, our own LeVar Burton just produced a movie called The Right to Read, uh, one of the greatest civil rights challenges of our time. So I think that that effort is shifting um, its focus from education to equity, which is really important because if you can't read, you're not going to get in the voting booth. That is the bottom line. And so um, if we want everybody voting and participating, which I do, we got to get them reading. So schools are thinking about how to bring in curriculum that's working right now. I think um, we can really look at Twin Rivers that's really looking at teacher training um, in evidence-based curriculum, uh, which is a set science uh, curriculum that gets amazing results. Um, and there's lots of different- Tell us about these results. Yeah. What? You say they're amazing. Tell right. us well, more. I, I can, I'll, I'll give you Mississippi, which is my favorite example, um, which is that in 2015, they passed policy statewide to introduce the science of reading evidence-based curriculum into all kindergarten through second grade classrooms. Pre-COVID, they tested. So remember, we tested at 44% pre-COVID. They tested at 85% pre-COVID. 85% of wow. the graders after three years of this set science were reading at grade level. I mean, that's a pizza party for the whole, for all the third graders. I think <laughs> it's simply, um, that's really an accomplishment that it, it just should be like the, the thing in all of the, the, the news, the newspapers should be talking about that. And who, how can we all follow? Locally, what's working? Is there, are there any examples of, of either school districts or schools where you see the type of program you're describing in Mississippi uh, having to, impact? Yeah, I think we're starting to see Twin Rivers introduce the science of reading through their teacher training, which is a very, very big part of teaching kids is teaching the teachers the, the science of reading as well. Um, putting that kind of uh, learning into college programs is, is, is a task in and of itself. Um, I think that uh, we have other, other, the other districts don't necessarily operate district-wide together. So you have little pieces of schools here and there. SCOE's uh, running a grant for, there was a right to- uh, Who's SCOE? SCOE, Sacramento County Office of Education. And they're running a $50 million grant that's going to the 79 schools at the bottom um, because of a lawsuit. And they're really working hard at bringing evidence-based practices to those schools as well. Um, so th those are the places I think that we're seeing some, some movement, but I think we'll see a lot more. Um, I think things are changing um, to the fact that we're on this show is, is, a, is a part of that. Give us, uh, take us back to the beginning. One of the things that uh, I've heard in, in many different venues is that third grade is a magic time. What is it about reading at grade level or being proficient by third grade? What makes that so important? Michael, I saw you wanted to say something. You want to take that question and say whatever you wanted to say. I have a six-year-old and we talk about like third grade and being ready for third grade and that being so important. My six-year-old for math, she's in first grade, like for math, most of her math problems are word problems. So if you don't show up to school able to learn, or able to know your ABCs, all these different foundational fanatics and all these different foundational elements, you are not even able to do first grade math. So you, you fast forward three years into school, you're in third grade, not able to read at grade level, which means you also aren't proficient in math. You aren't proficient in writing. My, my daughter's writing topic sentences in like in first grade. So you, you, you can't do any of that by, by third grade. So, you know, it's so important to make sure cause that that's the cutoff, right? That from there, I think April always says it, right? You, you learn to read and then what was the saying, April? You learn to read up to the third grade, or you're supposed to, and then the fourth grade, you read to learn. Uh, uh, explain what that really means. Well, in the fourth grade, you are not learning to read anymore. Nobody's helping you decode words. 
Nobody's going over the, the, the reading assignments, read out loud. What they're saying is read the word problem and answer the question. Read the essay and write some sentences about that. So, so help us understand um, a, a common, maybe it's a myth, but a statement, which is sometimes um, observers of a particular child will say, well, you know, they're, they're just starting off slow, but they're going to catch up. And it's not necessarily taken all that seriously. What I'm hearing from both of you is that, no, that's extremely serious. The, the other thing that I, I would just mention is there's an incredible focus on STEM related to, you know, math and science. And that if, if a child can master math and science, you know, everything else kind of comes secondary. Give us a, a little bit of insight into how math and science are related to reading proficiency. Well, if I can, can I, I think this is important. Uh, my, uh, my, so how boys and girls like developmentally. So given that girls are proven to develop faster, they can often right, have this expedient nature to be able to just uh, a higher likelihood, right, to be able to be proficient. Whereas boys like develop a little slower and I see it, I see it in my own kids. So I think what the challenge in schools is because like it is like it's a cookie cutter model, right? There, there, there's not a lot of ability to provide the individual help, which means in the work that we do, like for supporting young men of color, we see boys who who enter school not prepared, who are in school not at grade level, then eventually have all the other like negative like life outcomes because in schools we don't we treat them exactly the same. Like my six year old daughter and my four year old boy are two drastically different people in the way they learn. My daughter, from when she was four, we can sit down with her and we can do all the all the phonics, all the being able to understand worth. My four-year-old at the same age my daughter was is not able to yet, but yet they will both be six-year-old in first grade. So how do you developmentally adjust for boys and girls? I don't think we have, we have not gotten that right yet. Okay. April, uh, anything you want to add on that one? No. Well, I want to I want to turn this back and and look at um, what might be April some of the special challenges of limited English proficiency students who are speaking English as a second language coming from their homes. Uh, are they uh, is the way to address their reading proficiency identical to students who for whom English is their first language? Well, that is a really good question, and, and fairly, um, if you start to dig underneath it, one of one at the bottom of one of the big controversies. Um, I think that um, the following is true: phonemic awareness, which is the, un, the which is the ability to hear sounds, which is one of the things that kids who can't read struggle with. They might have had a, a kind of an ear infection as a kid, ongoing thing, or maybe they are speaking two languages, and so they have two sets of phenomes that you're trying to address. So I think that what the real issue isn't so much are the kids struggling or can they all learn the same way? Because probably they can. It's can we create the same curriculum in various languages to help kids all learn the same way, right? I mean, that's that it, it's really on us, not the kids, but yes, all kids can learn the same way. There is a set way to just pull apart sounds, show like, like cat, cat, at, has it's three sounds. Put a cat next to that and those sounds, and then talk about hat, and then talk about mat. And then, you know, maybe in a year you're putting letters to that cat and that hat and that mat. And and this is the process of developing decoding. Right? It's it's called decoding at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. We we did that as kids, you and I, Scott. I don't know, Michael, you're much younger than us, and I'm not sure you got real decoding growing up. But we yeah, did yeah. as kids, you know, when in doubt, sounded out. That was really a big, a big part of our learning. Um, and so I think that, yeah, all brains can learn equally. I think that it's can we can we learn how to teach all brains equally? I think that's really a question. Mm -hmm. Michael, for for the young men that you're working with in IYT, if they don't have that proficiency, but they've got a strong desire. How does your program and, and programs like yours, how do you 
get these young people what they need so that then they can have the benefit of all the other services that you provide. I think April said it best where she said all kids can learn at the same level. So for us, we know we get like our young men in all various different stages. Some are proficient in school, some are excelling, but a lot of them are, are struggling. So for us, the first thing that we do is build a significant relationship. You know, our, we have a mentorship based college access and completion program. And we believe no significant change happens without significant relationships. So we build a significant relationship with a young person. And then the challenge that we see a lot with our kids is that like, they are thinking only about today. So their decisions that they make are only about today, not about what happens in the future. So we have to get them to, like, to future cast. That's when we go on college tours and career exploration and give them all the different phenomenal events. Typically between those two things of college tours, mentorship, with some additional tutoring, we see young people transform. Transform, but they go from 1.0s to 4.0s, college graduates, working in professional settings, places where they now have generationally changed their, their life outcomes, like for their kids and their grandkids. Wonderful. April, what's the impact of technology on reading literacy among school-age children? You know, I don't, I don't know the exact answer to that. I know a lot of parents feel like their kids are a little in the, in the phone. Um, I think that my kid learned how to spell by texting. So I don't know. I think that there's, I think there's good things and I think there's bad things about technology. Well, um, the, the reason I'm asking the question is because um, there are stories uh, in, in the popular media that talk about how uh, the, interaction with technology is helping to, to spur children's cognitive development. So cell phones and iPads are actually good things. But I'm trying to get to the reality as to whether or not those things actually play a, a positive or a negative role in children's cognitive development as they try to move toward reading proficiency. I think Michael would be able to answer that better. What the data says, I mean, just on a soft side, I think that the data says like for the last 20 years, we've failed at kids reading. So 20 years ago, they didn't have all these devices and now they do. So I think the failures remained intact in terms of the reading level. It's been about at 35% nationally for this whole period. So I don't know if there's any research out there to say that technology has furthered or, 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 De de decreased uh, re reading levels, but I think maybe on the social side, which is where Michael's talking more, it, it might it, it, there might be showing a bigger impact. I don't know. Michael would be Michael. Do you have a point of view on that one? I think you know we're we're going to have to meet kids where they are. Like they are, their phone is right here. There is there is no way to take away a kid's phone, especially starting in middle school. So. For one, I'm going to be able to tackle like the literacy gap, even like working towards some of the kids who are not able to read when they're in, you know, 12, 13, et cetera. You, you can start partially by meeting them where, where they're at with their phone. And then that can be able to be some skills because you're just like today, I remember when I, was, when I was in high school, you couldn't even have phones out. They would, they would take your phone. Now phones are everywhere. 98% of kids, despite income level, have a phone and they have sort of access to the internet through their phone. So if we can figure out how to meet them where they are at their phone and give them some of the skills and resources to support, you, you, I feel like you should be able to see like growth. Uh, but, but the problem is most, most times, again, like schools aren't going to uh, be able to mold to what the young person or the needs or wants or even oftentimes what's effective. They're going to think about what has happened in the past and not about what strategy can we use today. I feel like we need a reading app that is as fun as Pokemon Go or Fortnite that has kids leveling up and getting all kinds of rewards. And I mean, what, what we need is an app developer and a company interested in that. But there's a way that I think we could take this moment and build something for kids that would also help them read and be fun and be in their, in, in, in their range. So that's my pitch to anybody out there. <laughs> all right. And I think that we'll leave it there. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests, and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE.
All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org slash video.